Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Thor Love and Thunder. Taika Waititi's follow-up to Thor Ragnarok that delivers all the goat screams from here to eternity. Let's break down all the MCU references, visual details, and deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed in Thor 4. Poor gore scores gory Tor. A story of war glory, lore by Korg. I'm sorry, that sentence is a belabored chore. Currently being written in the comics. Snore. I'm done, I promise. Now the best way to support us at New Rockstars is to check out our our latest Thor-inspired shirt at NewRockStarsMerch.com. The film opens on cracked desert sand as the shadow of Gore, not yet the God Butcher, and his daughter trudge through the unforgiving sun. Now this daughter is actually played by India Rose Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth's daughter. Just a little tease of her destiny as Thor's adopted daughter by the end of this movie, revealed to be an adaptation of the Marvel cosmic entity of love. It's just so clever to open this movie with Gore, we think, but really introduce here the love of the Love and Thunder title. But also this prologue establishes the film's deeper question of can gods love? Is love unique to mortals as love requires sacrifice, humility, a simplistic outlook that normally eludes immortals? But also the question is love a gift from the gods? And if so, what would it take for the gods to appreciate love themselves? Because if gods let so many terrible things happen, are those gods really loving or even capable of love? Now the villain of Gore the God Butcher was introduced in Jason Aaron's God of Thunder comics. Gore began as a starving being on an unknown harsh planet whose mate and children all die off. His prayers go unanswered by the gods, leading him to be exiled by his superstitious community for when he turns atheistic. Until two gods crash land right near him, one possessing All Black the Necro Sword, which Gore then uses to begin his deicidal killing spree. All Black in the comics was a weapon of Null, the symbiote deity, who used All Black to decapitate the celestial that became nowhere. All Black fuses with the bearer's arm and becomes part of him, sort of the way the symbiote does. However, here in the films, since Sony owns the film rights to the symbiotes, they simply just call this weapon the Necro Sword, leaving out that whole symbiote backstory, opting instead to make this broadsword give one entry to the Shadow Realm. Now, Gore's appearance has been changed. Christian Bale is not yet desaturated, and they let him keep his nose. Taika Waititi admitted that making him noseless would look too much like Voldemort from the Harry Potter films. Now, I like how all of this opens in the arid desert, an elemental contrast to the film's destination. The Realm of Eternity is seen as endless water, and the final shot of this movie is on a beach, Gore's daughter finally reaching the water that they sought for so long. But notice how here the only element they get is sunlight, which is ironic because Gore has been praying to a sun deity, and now too much sun has ruined him. And it's also fitting that our very first shot of Gore is his shadow, as his possession of the Necro Sword will give him access to the Shadow Realm. Gore's daughter says only two words in this opening prologue, I'm tired, and she dies, leaving behind some paintings she made on a boulder, these paintings praising the sun deity that they pray to. Gore finds an insanely flowery, lush oasis, clearly planted there by that beloved sun god, whom he calls the bringer of light. This is Rapu, played by Johnny Brew, New Zealand actor, comedian, and Taika Waititi's co-star from the film version of What We Do in the Shadows. But this god mocks Gore and brags about slaying an unnamed foe, another deity, with an inky black corpse, previous bearer of the Necrosword. This guy might be Ka, the warlord of the Shadow Realm. When the Shadow Realm was introduced in the 1960s Strange Tales comic issue, Ka was able to command and living shadows as warriors, as Gore does in this film. And Gore hears a voice from the Necrosword, go to eternity if it's revenge you seek. And he sees a vision of eternity itself. So eternity is a Marvel cosmic entity, the living embodiment of the universe itself, depicted as a cloaked silhouette filled with stars and planets. Actually, before this, there was a moment in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 when Star-Lord says, I, I see it. Eternity. And while James Gunn has said Quill wasn't really seeing capital E Eternity there, his trance-like state does look a lot like what Gore goes through here. In addition to seeing the face of Eternity, he does see the imprint of the Bifrost as Eternity's heart. Just a little clue that the Bifrost is a mechanism by which they're able to access Eternity. So Gore now wields the Necrosword and stabs Rapu through the head, and he bleeds gold! A color bled by many from Omnipotent City, and his body disintegrates into gold dust. The same thing that happens to Odin's body as he dies in Ragnarok. And now that Gore is tethered to the Shadow Realm, he turns monochromatic, color playing a very important role in this movie because shadow, as the absence of light, contains fewer colors in the spectrum, a visual opposite to the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge. So we have shadow, no color, versus rainbow, all the colors. And Gore vows, Oh God, she will die. Then over the Marvel Studios title card, Michael Giacchino's fanfare music is actually played by electric guitar instead of an orchestra this time. Among the updates to the MCU title card, the other characters who appear within the letters, 
Moon Knight appears in the M, and Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan, appears in the R. It's her final look, presumably from the finale episode. That episode hasn't even come out yet. Korg narrates to the Indigarian children the story of Thor Odinson, this legend really forming the framing device of this entire film. It's set to Only Time by Enya. Flashbacks show baby Thor in a Bjorn on Frigga's chest mid-battle. Thor Bjorn. You're really tempting me with this rhyming scheme here. This baby carries a little wooden Mjolnir, and this actor is named Cameron Chapek, and I'm wondering if he might be one of the grandkids of Disney CEO Bob Chapek. Just because every kid in this movie is someone's kid. Then we see this coming of age montage showing Thor running through the trees, which reminds me a lot of Simba's aging montage during the Akuna Matata song. And I gotta say, all the running, the wandering, the trekker hats of this movie make this film an interesting companion watch to Forrest Gump. Also a story about a wanderer who's a not the brightest guy, who goes on a series of adventures, including through war and on boats, until he reunites with his loved one, a dying woman, and ends the film a single father looking after a young kid. But back here during this montage, the youngest version of Thor is a cameo by one of Hemsworth's sons, Tristan. So along with his daughter, India Rose, this truly is a family film. Fun fact, their mom, Elsa Pataki, cameoed in the post credit scene of Thor The Dark World as the Jane Foster stand-in whom Hemsworth kissed in the post credit scene. Elsa actually cameos in this movie. She is the wolf woman that Thor hooks up with. I also like how young adult Thor wears the classic bright blue pants and yellow boots that Thor wears in the 60s and 70s comics. Korg recounts Thor's adventures on a pirate ship as a kraken swallows another ship in the background. All this perhaps a nod to Taika Waititi's other 2022 title, HBO's Our Flag Means Death, an amazing show. Waititi also said that he envisioned this film as a Mills and Boone romance novel, covers that would often feature this kind of imagery with a beautiful couple and a hero with his chest exposed as they kiss on the deck of a ship. This pirate woman is played by Zia Kelly, who is also Natalie Portman's stunt performer in this film. Korg also explained how Thor hooked up with a wolf woman on the back of a giant wolf, all three howling at a full moon, this large wolf might be connected to Fenris, the giant wolf enforcer of Hela in Ragnarok. We see flashbacks from shots in the 2011 Thor, 2013's Dark World, and a hint at their breakup as Jane slaps Thor in the face, and then we pick back up with Thor's weight gain in Avengers Endgame and team up with the Guardians of the Galaxy at the end of that film, leading to this full team up shot, showing them walking out of the fire. We see Mantis, Rocket, Kraglin, now wearing Yondu's fin after Guardians Volume 2, Peter Quill Star-Lord, and Thor in the middle, Nebula, Groot, and Drax, who is somehow visible here. Thor is still in his heavy armor and braided Viking beard from the endgame final battle. But Thor loses weight by doing battle ropes with chains on a giant skeleton. We don't get an answer to who this was, but it might be one of Eitri's people. You'll notice how Thor wears his trucker hat, which originally said the Avengers, Thor, Ant-Man, Hulk, and Iron Man, but he crossed out the the and the S and then wrote strongest over all the other names except his own name so that it now reads Thor, strongest Avenger, which itself is a callback to the bit in Ragnarok. Strongest Avenger. Access denied. Strongest Avenger. Access denied. Voice activation required. Banner. Welcome, Strongest Avenger. Oh, uh, what? And overall, Thor's look with the hat, in addition to reminding me of Forrest Gump, combined with his later look in the tank top, seems inspired by Vincent D'Onofrio in Avengers and Babysitting when the girl thought Dawson, the auto worker, was Thor. We find Thor meditating beneath this tree on his war-torn planet. He has planted Stormbreaker, and when he unearths it, fresh roots come up with the handle. Because remember, Stormbreaker's handle was made of Groot's arm, and Groot has proven that he can regenerate from a single splinter when it is replanted. So Stormbreaker might have actually been in the process of turning into a new tree until Thor violently uprooted it. Thor rides down into the battle, riding Stormbreaker like a broomstick, which is actually a callback to Korg's line in Ragnarok. You rode a hammer. No, I, I didn't ride the hammer. The hammer rode you on your back. No, no, no. I, I used to spin it really fast and it, it would it would pull me off the Oh my god, the hammer pulled you off. Then Thor greets the locals. As you know, we used to live in a peaceful oasis. But then our gods were murdered. Murdered? And now our sacred temple has been left unguarded and Hoku's swords took control of its power. It is our most sacred shrine and he desecrates. Not for long. Uh. Yes, their gods were, of course, murdered by Gore. And despite Thor promising to save this sacred shine, by the end of the battle, he further desecrates it when it collapses. Just another example of the gods of this universe really being incapable of love. Now, yes, the tribe he is defending are the same people Korg was narrating to in the opening story, the Indigarians, presumably named for their indigo hue. They are led by King Yakan, played by Australian actor Stephen Curry, and the raiders are bird-like psychos led by Habuska the Horrible, played by Bobby Holland Hanton, Chris Hemsworth's longtime stunt actor. 
actor in all these Marvel films as well as the Extraction films. Thor's outfit beneath his robe is inspired by Kurt Russell's look in Big Trouble Little China, Kurt Russell of course playing Peter Quill's father, Ego, and Thor's white tank top shows a depiction of the Nine Realms in Yggdrasil, the world street. Though behind the branches of it, you can see the pattern imprint made by the Bifrost, the same marking from Gore's vision that showed the heart of eternity. Just another clue pointed to the Bifrost being the key that unlocks that gate. Thor also wears a red vest jacket, which looks like a modded version of Peter Quill's Ravager's jacket that Thor has bedazzled. Thor fights these raiders, raining down on them in a wide shot, recalling Thor's God of Thunder power up in Ragnarok when he rained down Hela's army on the bridge battle. And Thor wedges between two chariots, making a Jean-Claude Van Damme pose. Meanwhile, Jane Foster gets an MRI scan and undergoes some chemo treatment, this movie adapting Jason Aaron's Mighty Thor storyline in which Jane Foster gets cancer before she powers up into the Mighty Thor. Gets in next door, reads a book, Jane Foster, Theory of Space and Time, and she explains to him Einstein rose in bridges, aka wormholes, something she geeked out about in the 2011 film, and here references the folding piece of paper and pencil poking through it analogy from Christopher Nolan's movie Interstellar. Jane also mentions sci-fi horror Event Horizon, which stars longtime Watiti collaborator Sam Neill, who also appears in this film, and in Ragnarok as a stage actor who plays Odin. Darcy shows up, bringing her some snacks. This is the first we've seen Darcy since WandaVision. Now notice how while Jane has her sleeves rolled up to get the treatment here, these early shots deliberately frame out Natalie Portman's arms, since she got pretty toned for this movie and they wanted to save her bulked up appearance until after her transformation. Jane also video chats with Dr. Eric Selvig, her colleague from the earlier films, who was also recently referenced for his research in alternate dimensions in Ms. Marvel. Selvig tells Jane his attempts to do immunotherapy on her blood have failed, so Jane heads to New Asgard, which now, under Valkyrie's leadership, has evolved into a commercialized tourist economy. We see an Asgard-themed Old Spice commercial. There's also an ice cream parlor called Infinity Cones in the shape of Thanos' gauntlet. In the port are cruise liners, one of which is painted with the face of Volstag, one of Thor's Warriors Three, who died in Ragnarok. Also in the town, there is a Simonson Street, named after Thor writer Walt Simonson, who actually cameoed as an Asgardian in the 2011 Thor film, so he may actually be an Asgardian that they named a street after. There's also an Aaron Avenue, named after Jason Aaron. Now remember, in Ragnarok, Loki as Odin watched a play restaging the events of the previous film, Thor The Dark World, and now this theater company restages the events of Ragnarok, Odin's death and Hela's arrival and destruction of Mjolnir. Matt Damon returns as the actor who plays Loki, Chris Hemsworth's brother Luke Hemsworth returns as Thor, and Sam Neill returns as the Odin actor, Melissa McCarthy cameos as Hela, her real life husband and comedy partner Ben Falcone also cameos as the stage manager that you see when they do the curtain call. The broken shards of Mjolnir remained on the mound of turf where Hela left them. It's now encased in glass on a pedestal for tourists to witness. This means that the Hela fight occurred right in this spot. And the fact that no one can move even these broken shards mean that they still possess Odin's original magic charm, a charm that was later updated by Thor to protect Jane, which is why these broken pieces now move for her. Now the tour guide is actor Daly Pearson, who played Daryl in Taika Waititi's Team Thor short films that came out on the Civil War Blu-ray. Since then, they were considered non-canon, but I don't know, with Daryl here, I'm just gonna assume they're canon. Now the production actually shot a scene for Jane's power up moment, but apparently was left out of the final cut, presumably to make Jane's new form more of a reveal. The people whom Thor saved reward him with screaming goats named Tooth Grinder and Tooth Nasher. These are based on Thor's goats in Norse mythology, Tangri and Tanyost. They're given alternate looks, one light furred with simple horns, one dark furred with spiraled horns. As these goats wreck the Benatar, the Guardians bring up hundreds of distress calls that they have received. Their 3D star map shows the galaxy divided into red highlighted jigsaw sectors, which might display the political boundaries of rival empires like the Kree, the Skrull, the Xandarians, something we might learn more about in the Marvels or Guardians Volume 3. Now there actually was going to be more in this movie for Gore's killing spree because Christian Bale talked about shooting scenes with Peter Dinklage and Jeff Goldblum suggesting Gore would have killed Eitri and the Grand Master, but those scenes were removed. And actress Lena Headey actually got into some legal drama over payments for a role in this movie, suggesting she also would have played some other god that Gore murdered. The distress calls show Gore's various victims, including gods hanging from the gallows, imagery evoking Isad Rivik's art of crucified gods and Jason Aaron's God of Thunder storyline. Another distress call shows a severed head that is just left on the ground, and Korg gasps, the horror, referencing Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. Thor recognizes one of the distress calls coming from Lady Sif, and he parts ways with the Guardians. Human handshake, it's the Asgardian shake, into the snake, 
that you cannot trust. Yes, Thor is calling back his Loki snake story from Ragnarok. He transformed himself into a snake and he knows that I love snakes. So I went to pick up the snake to admire it and he transformed back into himself and he was like, yeah, it's me. And he stabbed me. Now, not all of us can have the physique of Thor and all of his rivals, but gentlemen, there is power in strength and having nice skin. We can do our best to match Thor's nice, clear complexion. Leave those dark circles under the eyes to gore. The fine folks at Geology have some great skincare products that you're going to love. Geology is the nine time award-winning men's skincare company that creates simple, effective, personalized skincare products for men. Just click the link in the video's description and take a 30 second quiz. Tell them about your skin and their team of dermatologists will design a regimen just for you that ships directly to your door. Their products are great for whatever you're worried about, acne, dark eye circles, wrinkles. They send you a 30 day trial set that's easy to incorporate into your routine, whether you're new to skincare or a seasoned expert. So here's what they sent me. I got some everyday face wash, pretty straightforward and simple. And then here's what I like to call sunrise and sunset, a little morning kiss and a little lullaby, <laughs> vital morning face cream and repairing at night cream. And then if your eyes aren't feeling too great, you just got some nourishing eye cream. It's the four horsemen of fun and I'm so grateful to them. Talking with the rest of the new Rockstars team, they're just big fans of the fancy eye cream. Our hosts might be up late to pump out content, but they don't look like it thanks to this cream. Geology makes it easy to take care of your skin. No need to become an amateur dermatologist. They're offering a crazy deal right now. You can get 70% off on their 30 day five piece trial kit. Head on over to geology.com for 70% off on your 30 day trial. When you use the code of rockstars70 or just click the link below, that's geology.com promo code rockstars70 to save 70% off your 30 day trial. So Thor, Korg, and the goats use Stormbreaker to bifrost over to Lady Sif's planet where we see the aftermath of a battle, including the corpse of Falagar the Behemoth fading into golden dust. The imagery here taken directly from Rubik's comic art down to the details of the blood trickling from Falagar's nose. And they find Lady Sif as she prepares to enter Valhalla, teasing the Norse afterlife realm that Jane and Heimdall are in in the post credit scene. But Thor reminds us that in order to enter Valhalla, one must die in battle, but that Sif's severed arm might be in Valhalla. Valhalla actually gets mentioned at least half a dozen times throughout this film. More mentions, I think, than any other of the MCU films combined. All of this is to set up the final scene where Jane meets Heimdall in Valhalla. Jamie Alexander was absent from Thor Ragnarok, which is why she wasn't killed by Hela, but a form of her did appear in Loki in a mental torture room in the TVA. Gore arrives to New Asgard at night, moving in and out of the shadows. Shadows that move on their own, creeping along the ground, looking a lot like the demonic shadows that we saw in 1990's Ghost. A movie that, you know, a lot of people sleep on, but like this movie is a fascinating supernatural horror tragic comedy. I'm telling you, in addition to watching this movie this weekend, you should also go home and watch Forrest Gump and Ghost. You're welcome, I just gave you an awesome weekend. The children of Asgard actually include several of the star's children, Sasha Hemsworth, and then Tay and Matewa Watiti, Natalie Portman's children, Aleph and Amala, and Christian Bale's son, Rex. The shadow beasts attack, and they actually look a lot like the black berserkers that are controlled by Gore in the comics. Valkyrie rides in her Pegasus from Endgame into the fight, and Thor helps out until he hears the familiar metallic hum of Mjolnir. Mjolnir, hey boy! Mjolnir? I love the detail on Mjolnir bursting out of this creature, its eyes bulging out. And despite the exclusion of Jane's power up, I really like how they shot her reveal here. They delayed the reveal of Jane by keeping our eyes focused on Mjolnir itself, which in many ways is an equally unusual return for Thor in this moment. Notice how we start with the weapon going into her hand and then it goes down to focus on her eyes and Natalie Portman's face is covered here. And then we move further down so that we can see her bulky arms. So this just allows Jane to be her badass self. And she swings into action. Yeah, she starts by swinging the hammer from its strap, which is how Cap initially charges up the hammer before hitting Thanos when he wielded it in Endgame. And here we get a close up of the hammer's disc plate with the runes that translate to, he who wields this hammer commands the lightning and the storm. The broken pieces whiz past Thor, who stands before the Black Raven Tavern, a nod to Odin's ravens from Norse mythology in the earlier Thor films. They actually mention Raven Mail a few times throughout this film, ravens being how they send messages to each other, their very archaic version of email, also something that was referenced in the 
the Team Thor short. Valkyrie later says her meetings could have been Raven mail, like the this meeting could have been an email meme. And it's just so satisfying to see these broken shards click back into place perfectly, like that shrine of the silver monkey in the first go. And broken Mjolnir is just the perfect metaphor for Jane herself, someone who is in an imperfect physical state, but whose brokenness actually makes her stronger. So we flash back to Thor and Jane's relationship, which unfolded in the background between Thor the Dark World and Age of Ultron, and a couple years after, when Thor was on and off world during that period. Thor lists Nick Fury on his phone as Nick Furry, which is a callback to a joke in the Team Thor short. Fury, what does he really know and is Fury, his real name, or is it actually pronounced furry? I love it. The way Midgardians cannot pronounce Mjolnir, Mjolnir, as Guardians cannot pronounce things like Nick Fury and Jane Foster. And also based on what we've seen from Secret Invasion, Fury is looking pretty furry. We see a Halloween party where Thor dresses up as a hot dog, while Jane dresses up as Kane from Alien with a chestburster. I actually dressed up just like that one year for Halloween. We learn Thor asked Mjolnir to always protect Jane, and we see Odin's symbol fading up on that hammer showing how Odin's worthiness charm extended to include Jane from that moment on. All this is set to ABBA's Our Last Summer, this montage showing Jane and Thor drifting apart, sitting further and further apart on the sofa, akin to the classic marriage montage in Citizen Kane, where Kane and his wife sit further and further apart at the dinner table as the years go by. Gore uses shadows to kidnap the children of Asgard and he retreats, Thor and Jane catch up. So they broke up before Ragnarok in 2017. The present MCU year is understood to be 2025, which is why Thor says it's been eight years, seven months. Eight years, seven months, and six days, give or take. However, the Endgame screenplay listed Jane among the blip victims, which might be why to her it only seemed like three or four years. The parents of Asgard are panicking. We see Valkyrie's PJs including a Phantom of the Opera shirt, which seems a bit random, but I don't know. The Phantom wears a half mask, does look a lot like the way Eternity is half masked in its statue form. In this moment, Thor only has eyes for Jane. The old ex-girlfriend. Judy Foster. Yeah, Korg never gets her name right either. He called her Jane Fonda earlier. And as Thor tries to snatch Mjolnir back, Stormbreaker gets jealous. Jealous Stormbreaker is like my favorite character in this movie. Now you'll notice Natalie Portman is framed in all of these scenes to look taller than she actually is, especially when you see her beside Tessa Thompson, because those two actresses are roughly the same height. Kevin Feige confirmed that making Portman taller is the only VFX they had to do to her. One parent in this room shouts, half our soldiers are always dead. I love this line because it calls back how the Asgardians have lost a lot, like when they fled Asgard and Ragnarok, and then after that, they lost another half of them when Thanos' forces called them to steal the Space Stone at the beginning of Infinity War, and then we didn't see them after that point, but when Thanos snapped his fingers, another half of them were snapped away. So at this point, the Asgardians are down to like 12.5% of what they were. I like how Meek takes minutes, dressed as a classic clerical worker, her blade extension swapped out for a dry erase marker. Now, one of these kidnapped kids is Heimdall's son, Astrid, who says that his name is Axel, named himself after Axel Rose of Guns N' Roses. Actually, earlier in the movie, we saw a poster in Axel's room for the Guns N' Roses album, Appetite for Destruction, and he wore a shirt for the Guns N' Roses Use Your Illusion album. He speaks to them using Heimdall's orange-eyed magic, where he can link his consciousness across the galaxy. We see Thor linking with him, as he did with Heimdall in Ragnarok. And into this cage, Thor realizes it is headed toward the Shadow Realm, and he flips back and notice now that he has some black smudges on his cape, showing how Gore's shadows were beginning to eat away at him. Thor describes the Shadow Realm. The atmosphere there has a darkness like no other. It's as if color feels to tread. If it's color we need, let's bring the rainbow. But hang on, he moves through shadows and he's going to the Shadow Realm. It seems like that's where he's gonna be the most powerful. Are you thinking what I think you're thinking? I'm thinking it. Omnipotent, Omnipotent City. City. Omnipotent City, another detail from Jason Aaron's God of Thunder run, constructed by the Lords of the Dawn, with trimmings from the clay of creation, fired with the embers of the first sun. And here Thor name drops his favorite gods. He says, we can recruit Ra, Hercules, Tumatoanga, Quetzalcoatl maybe, and Zeus. And yes, he buried Hercules in there, setting up the son of Zeus and the longtime rival to Thor in the comics, who's introduced, played by Brett Goldstein, in the post credit scene. Ra, of course, is the Egyptian sun god who did not show up in Moon Knight. Tuma Toenga is Maori god of war and hunting, and Quetzalcoatl is the Aztec creation deity depicted as a feathered serpent. Jane smashes her sink as she recalls how her mother, Elaine, also died of cancer. So we got Elaine Foster, Meredith Quill, Maria Rambeau. What is it with the moms of cosmically powered MCU heroes dying of cancer? And by the way, the name Elaine might be a Seinfeld 
Seinfeld reference because this movie's working title was The Big Salad, which was a reference to a Seinfeld episode. By the way, Spider-Man No Way Home's working title was Serenity Now, which was another Seinfeld reference. Thor promises that Asgardian that they'll return with the children, but not for them to feast on. Suggesting the Asgardians used to eat kids at some point? Yikes. They install Stormbreaker on one of the floating Asgard tour boats. This one named the Eger. Eger is a Norse god of the sea and a big partier in the Marvel comics. This boat also has a neon sign reading Cocktails and Dreams, a prop from the 1988 Tom Cruise movie Cocktail. I like how Stormbreaker casts this rainbow bridge before the goat's feet that disappears behind them. I just always love to see the Bifrost as an actual bridge platform for people to walk on. And the chunks of this bridge are the kind of glowing fiberglass look that the Bifrost bridge was back in Asgard. And they arrive in an omnipotent city and it looks a lot like it does in the comics. And notice how there are various waterfalls just pouring down from higher and higher tiers like an infinity pool snaking through an aqueduct. And this shimmering design looks a lot like a more advanced version of Asgard, suggesting that one inspired the other. It's kind of like being more familiar with Disney World and then visiting Disneyland and realizing, oh, it's the same thing. It's just a more condensed and cultier. Jane brainstorms more catchphrase options like eat this hammer or check out my hammer. But it's her first bad guy and Thor responds, never forget you first. Meanwhile, Axe tries to cheer up the other kids, telling them about how Thor forged Stormbreaker from a dying star. We saw that in Infinity War and telling them how he used that ax to cut off Thanos' head in Endgame. Meanwhile, Gore creepily just appears in this cage and scares these kids away from the whole idea of something being beheaded by ripping off the head of his serpent. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew sneaks into the gods meeting disguised as emotion gods. And there are some amazing cameos of gods here. There's a golden dragon that looks a lot like the great protector of Ta Lo from Shang-Chi. There's a giant eyeball. There's Bao, the god of dumplings, who's actually voiced by Simona Paparelli Wolf, a longtime Marvel Studios team member, Louis Desposito's assistant turned producer. Valkyrie mentions a god of magic, a god of dreams, and a god of carpentry who is off screen, but uh, yeah, implying that Jesus is MCU canon and hangs out with Zeus. We see two celestials peering in from outside the hall. Based on their appearances, the one on the left with the five eyes and the antlered head is a mad celestial from a 2012 Fantastic Four storyline when celestials tried to steal Reed Richards' alternate reality viewer to conquer the multiverse. And then on the right, that matches the design of a celestial gardener from a 2013 Uncanny Avengers storyline involving the planting of life seeds and death seeds in planets. Korg spots an old Cronin god who is also played by Taika Waititi via mocap. And I think my favorite detail of this movie, the Cronin god sits on a throne of scissors like the Iron Throne, but scissors, because, you know, rock beats scissors. You don't need to be afraid unless you're made of scissors. <laughs> Just a little rock, paper, scissor joke for you. So this is all part of a running rock, paper, scissors gag starting in Ragnarok where Korg's uprising failed because he didn't hand out enough paper leaflets. But Meek, who is a scissor person essentially, was able to defeat Sakarans, whom Drax previously referred to as paper people. There's sightings of sycophant gods and Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and partying played by Simon Russell Beale. There's a credited Aztec god played by Nico Cortez, perhaps that's Quetzalcoatl, whom Thor name dropped earlier. There is a credited Mayan god God, credited as actor Iman J. Hajiti, that is the giant figure who laughs from one of the higher thrones. Actress Chela Korewa plays a Maori goddess, presumably Tuma Toenga. Actor Kuni Hashimoto plays the Jade Moari god, that's the giant samurai figure whom Thor has to step over. Nicole Milinkovic plays the Elsh goddess, or Elk goddess, the Lady of Elke being a limestone bus that was recovered in Spain, believed to be a Carthaginian goddess worshipped by the Punic Iberians. Carmen Foon plays Minerva, considered to be the Roman version of the Greek Athena. Now yeah, Eternals does make this all a bit confusing since it was implied that the mythologies of Earth were inspired by the Eternals, like Athena, but Eternals were revealed to be synthetic beings made by the Celestials to help them pop planets. Presumably, the Eternals got their names and identities from these real gods. There's a crazy little fur God, played by Stephen Hunter, a New Zealand actor who played the dwarf Bumber in the Hobbit movies. Clarissa Vicente plays Goddess of the Dead, perhaps this entity from Aztec mythology. And sitting in the row directly in front of them is actor Akusia Sabet, who listed herself online as Bost or Bostet, who is the Wakandan panther deity, aka the Egyptian feline goddess. She is not credited in this movie, though. This could be an instance of an actor listing on their resume based on what they were told by casting directors and wardrobe people without the producer signing off on it. The reality is that actors don't have speaking lines in movies or have some scripted action that they have to do on camera or some specific purpose in a scene, they often don't have to be credited. But you know what, Akosia? You get yours! You are Bastet in our headcanon. And of course, Zeus appears, played by Russell Crowe, doing a Greek accent. He wows the crowd with his thunderbolt tricks. 
really the guy he's most obsessed with this year's orgy, which is very on brand for Zeus from Greek mythology. He's always turning into animals and like f***ing things. Thor presents himself to Zeus, who shrugs off the threat of gore and uncovers Thor's masquerade. Flip. Oh. You flick too hard, damn it! Except, of course, the real thing, we get some ass. Notice how Thor has some tattoos on his back. R.I.P. Loki with Loki's horned crown, the word brothers, a broken heart, and a scroll with some runes on it. But if you look closely at that, those ain't runes, it's actually names of people Thor has lost. The list reads Mother, Father, Heimdall, Loki, Tony, and Natasha. Yeah, sorry Vision, you didn't make the cut. Along the bottom of his back, a banner that reads Rest in Mischief. And based off of what we're seeing Loki doing in the TVA, in his second life, our dude is getting into plenty of mischief. Thor also said you flicked too hard, which reminds us of Avengers Endgame during the time ice when Ant-Man presented and told America's ass to flick him, and if you put the word flick in a comic book word bubble and italicize it, yeah, yeah, we, we, we know what flick means. Zeus says Gore will never reach eternity, and Valkyrie tells Jane, eternity is a very powerful being at the center of the universe. It will grant the desire of the first person who reaches it. And Jane asks, so it's like a wishing well? Well, eternity is not really a one-time wishing well in the comics, but eternity might have some reasons to grant one wish and peace out right now in the MCU. We'll talk about that a bit later. The guards have gold flesh and they bleed gold. They can be wonder if they might have been part of the Sovereign from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, but later one of those Asgardian kids says he's a Midasian, as in King Midas, so they might also be that. I just love how much Taika Waititi is able to embrace the golden bloodbath of this fight, because you know if the blood was red, there's no way they'd be allowed to do this in a PG-13 movie. Zeus thunderbolts Korg, but luckily Cronins get crumbled all the time, so as long as their mouth stays intact, they are okay. So that Cronin that Thor smashed back in the Dark World, as long as the mouth was intact, he didn't really kill him. Thor catches the thunderbolt and chucks it back through Zeus. Valkyrie ties Korg's face to the back of her braids so that the braids give him a bit of a mustache, foreshadowing his future soulmate Cronin with the Hannibar mustache, Dwayne. On the boat, Thor and Jane see some space dolphins, whom Thor says mate for life in packs of six. There's that number six coming back. Six OG Avengers, six Infinity Stones, six dolphins in an orgy. Korg sings this Cronin courtship song that he says his dad sang to each other, and he explains how Cronins hold hands over a lava pit for a month and then produce a new baby boy. So all Cronins are male. Korg references Valkyrie's girlfriend who died in their battle with Hela that we saw in the flashback in Ragnarok, but not really explored explicitly in that movie script. Taika Waititi shot that flashback using dynamic light technology from the satellite lab and used the same stunning lighting effect for this coming battle in the Shadow Realm. So Valkyrie's coming fight, for her at least, might be a bit triggering for her. And notice how when they fight, there's a light source that rapidly rotates around this small planet, creating these dizzying shadows, which is interesting for characters who are trying to fight the shadows. Like, they don't know which of the moving shadows are actual sentient threats and which of them are just natural on this terrain. Throughout this act, it's just visually haunting to see this fight desaturated into monochrome, again, because shadows contain no light and thus no color, the conceptual opposite of the rainbow that Thor and Jane are bringing. And I love how throughout this sequence, whenever they use light sources like Mjolnir or the Thunderbolts, color itself also emanates from that glow. There's a great gag here with a goat boat smashing into the planet, which is a much smaller moon than anticipated, a gag that we also saw in Rick and Morty. Let's go down and check her out. Oh, I thought it was further away. Gore ensnares them in his shadow beasts, looking especially creepy with his hollow eyes peering out from the darkness. Christian Bale's just frighteningly demonic throughout this. He rasps, call the axe. And looking ahead, the axe being the bringer of the Bifrost makes a bit of fitting terminology with Axel being the future Heimdall. Gore tells Thor, love is pain. My daughter is the lucky one as she does not have to grow up in a world of suffering and pain run by wicked gods. Choose love, call the axe. If you think about it, he's setting up his own choice to choose love, capital L love. By the end of this film, Thor will be someone who chooses love, his adopted daughter, in a new reality where this guy's gonna get around by calling Axel, his new Heimdall. Choose love, call the Axel. This fight ends with Valkyrie stabbed, all of them having to retreat in the Bifrost, but as that exit move was a huge mistake by Thor with Hela, it is also a mistake here with Gore, because he jumps into this Bifrost stream, grabbing Stormbreaker, leaving Thor and the rest to spiral off to some other location. Jane, now separated from Mjolnir, reverts to her weakened state, leaving her body unable to fight the cancer, as Mjolnir's power-ups due to her in the Jason Aaron comics. Thor gets the Thunderbolt from Valkyrie and uses it to catch up with Gore, who is now 
about taking the kids to this eternity chamber, it's interesting to see it assembling into place. I just think this is what Gore's travel looks like from his perspective from the Shadow Realm. Anytime he beams himself into a place, from his perspective, it looks like a room assembling around him. Now, of course, these statues are all known entities from Marvel Comics. At the center, of course, is a statue of eternity. But if we go clockwise from that, next is Lady Death, the skull face representation of death in Marvel lore. It was to woo her romantically that caused Thanos in the comics to embark on his Infinity Stone crusade. Then Eon, representing time. It's just a gross bearded freak that, no joke, Jim Starlin modeled on a stain on a garbage bag that he saw on the sidewalk. Then Infinity, considered Eternity's sister, believed to be associated with the Infinity Stones. On the other side of the chamber, though he was not visible in the trailer footage, is a green celestial. This is the celestial form of the one above all, another ranking cosmic power in the Marvel Universe. Then the Watcher, the multiversal overseer voiced by Jeffrey Wright in What If? And then lastly, the Living Tribunal, the ultimate cosmic legal authority with the three faces of necessity equity, and revenge. The Living Tribunal just showed up in Doctor Strange the Multiverse of Madness and appeared as another severed statue head showing up in the Void in Loki. So these seven entities share the chamber, so they might be on equal divine status, kind of checking and balancing each other. But it's also interesting that they are tucked away together like this in the center of the universe, almost like they've been exiled or hidden or just forced into retirement. Remember, in What If, the Watcher was forbidden from intervening, and perhaps all these entities are bound by some kind of non-intervention code unless someone knocks at their door. The fact that the Bifrost can open a gate through Eternity's statue to lead to Eternity's true form in that realm suggests that similar door number two or door number three could be opened into the Living Tribunal statue to talk to them or into the Watcher statue to talk to Jeffrey Wright. I cannot wait to see live action Jeffrey Wright Watcher in the MCU. Thor empowers each of the Asgardian kids by expanding Odin's worthiness charm. We get this great overhead shot that actually looks like a tree branching out, like Idrisil or like the roots of the Groot Arm Stormbreaker handle that we saw earlier. Now, among these kids, in addition to Axel, there is that Midassian kid, but also a like kid, a wolf boy. This lichen is played by actor Khan Gulder, who actually played young Arthur Curry in Aquaman. I'm wondering if this lichen kid might be Thor's illegitimate kid with that wolf woman. I don't know how long ago it was, but I think we should just, you know, we should, we should do a test. Jane ends up joining the fight using Val's Pegasus, and they're able to break the Necrosword, and Jane summons the fragments of Mjolnir back to catch some of the broken pieces of that sword with it, and then blast all of it with the lightning. But again, we see how Mjolnir's broken state gives it benefits that it otherwise would not have. Gorg goes through the open Eternity portal, where we see Eternity's true form. They actually pulled it off. It's a starry silhouette with the visage of a face, and it looks pretty cool. Eternity sits in a zen-like state and interestingly says nothing. Actually, Eternity's seated meditative pose mirrors Thor's meditation at the start of this film. Thor's eyes in that moment opened like the bluest skies. And there may be a metaphysical connection between him and Eternity, whose eyes stay closed in this final scene until Gore awakens him and those starry eyes eyes glow brighter and brighter. I mean, who knows? Maybe Eternity needed both Thor and Gore to find him at the center of the universe, so Eternity activated both the Lord of Thunder and the Lord of Love, so that Eternity could transform himself. Are we all simply pawns on the chessboard of space gods seeking to give themselves makeovers? I mean, if they do it in the name of love, who's to blame them? Now, this watery realm might be based on the dimension of manifestations, Eternity's realm from the 90s Quasar comics. It actually looks a lot like Thanos' soul realm, except with normal lighting. I just love how increasingly we're seeing more and more realms in addition to universes in the MCU. Natalie Portman said that they shot one of these scenes in a Best Buy parking lot. I am guessing it was this one. And remember, they described Eternity as a wishing well. And now here, in this hopeful, sunny, aquatic space, the imagery does evoke that of a wishing well. Jane encourages Gore to choose love. And after he gets an assurance that Thor will look after his daughter, he makes his one wish to Eternity, and a blinding light beams from Eternity's head. And the camera tilts down into the reflective water, where now, beside Gore's body, is a reflection of a girl with Eternity's starry form. A girl, now that we tilt up, is revealed to be his resurrected daughter. So love is another cosmic entity in the Marvel comics, because pretty much every abstract concept is actually a, a space god, eventually, in the Marvel comics. Love is considered on the tier of characters like Order and Chaos, considered on a slightly lower tier than Eternity, which makes sense because Korg calls her born from Eternity. But in this case, it looks like Eternity might have transfigured its life force into a new form, the living embodiment of love. Love. Who knows, maybe with the boundaries of the multiverse eroding due to incursions, this being who sees time as a flat circle felt that what the multiverse needs now more than a solid boundary is a force that transcends all boundaries, an active force of compassion. 
So in a way, eternity lives on, but now the force that binds the MCU together is love. And I kind of love that. Jane tells Thor that she finally came up with a catchphrase and whispers it in his ear. We don't hear what it was. This mystery whisper is in a way a nod to Jason Aaron's comics because Nick Fury whispers something in Thor's ear to make him drop Mjolnir. And that is what leads to Jane wielding it sometime after. We don't find out what Fury said until much later. We learn it was the words, Gore was right. That shook Thor to his core and made him feel unworthy. Now in this case, I am going to assume the whispered catchphrase is something specific to the two of them. Like, I'll never forget my first time. Or maybe something dumb, like, it's hammer time. The epilogue sequence shows a new statue built to honor Jane and new Asgard. Notice how the sculptors actually made the effort to chisel into Mjolnir to make sure that it is the cracked version of Mjolnir. You have to wonder if anyone from the ground level even notices that detail, but they took the time to do it and I love it. Valkyrie trains the children of Asgard. She's wearing a jersey for the new Asgard Kings and she is number one, but Sif trains Axel in private sessions. So you know we're gonna be calling that ax more in the future. Korg meets his love over a lava pit, Dwayne, which come on, has gotta be a nod to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I'll fight anyone who says different. Thor and Gore's daughter, Love, eat some breakfast, the same pancakes that Thor made for Jane, but now he's making some time to eat them with her. The girl is reading Jane's quantum physics book and Thor has to uncloak her green hood, reminding us of the reveal of Tony Stark's daughter, Morgan, in Endgame, whom Tony had to unmask from the helmet the first time we saw her. The two argue over her shoes that leads to her shouting, go to hell, demon, and firing purple optic blasts from her eyes. Who knows what this kid can do? This is like the new Jack-Jack of the MCU. She's a space god. She's an embodiment of love. I mean, the sky's not even the limit. And as a kid who loves to draw, she draws a lady face on Mjolnir, and then they charge into this beach battle to intervene in what looks like a clearly overmatched invasion by one force onto another. We see their big jump here that actually parallels the earlier shot of Thor leaping alone to defend the Indigarians. Now he is no longer alone. Guns N' Roses' sweet child of mine returns, and as I somehow predicted right in my breakdown of the very first teaser of this movie, beyond the fitting lyrics of praying for the thunder and the rain to quietly pass me by, the sweet child of mine of this song's title actually refers to the sweet child of Gore. And now this kid is the love to Thor's thunder. That's everything I spot in this movie. And hey, if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can actually come see me do improv live with Endgame's Improv every other Saturday night at 9 p.m. in the mission. Hit me up on Twitter or Instagram for details at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstar, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.